If you brought your Bible today or a tablet or iPhone or whatever it is that you use to study the scriptures on Sunday mornings, let's go ahead and raise those up high and make our weekly declaration together, shall we? This is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a light unto my path, and a lamp unto my feet. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. <laughs> and everyone agreeing said, Amen and Amen. Well, <clears throat> we have been going through a study out of the book of Judges in the Old Testament. Judges is right after Joshua and right before Ruth. We've also tabbed this book, the book of Heroes, because it is uh, really a story of God raising up heroes of the faith to deliver uh, His people. And last week we were in chapter 14 where we were introduced to a guy by the name of Sam. A guy who liked to tell riddles, uh, and perhaps the reason why is because his own life seemed to be nothing but a riddle. Very hard to understand, very hard to comprehend, because of the duplicity that marked his life. A life that uh, oftentimes just makes you scratch your head <laughs> and wonder what he was thinking and why he did what he did. And yet, what we also discovered is something very marvelous, and it's this. We discovered that Samson, despite all that, was still very, very much in God's plans and God's purposes to deliver the children of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And this morning, we discover more about the life of Samson as we are going to be looking together at chapter 15 and that will be our focus today and so chapter 15 is a relatively short chapter and so we're just going to read it all the way through and then we'll backtrack and we will comment uh, <coughs> through this uh, chapter. Verse 15, or excuse me, chapter 15, verse 1. It says, But after a while, so some time has elapsed, in the time of wheat harvest, Samson visited his wife with a young goat and said, I will go in to my wife in her room. But her father did not let him enter. Her father said, I really thought that you hated her intensely, so I gave her to your companion, actually his best man. <laughs> Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please let her be uh, yours instead. Samson then said to him, This time I shall be blameless in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. And Samson went and he caught 300 foxes and took torches and turned the foxes' tails uh, tail to tail and put one torch in the middle between the two tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, I mean picture this, he released the foxes into the standing grain of the Philistines thus burning up both the uh, shocks um, and the standing grain along with the vineyards and the groves. Then the Philistines said, Who did this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Temanite, because... He took his wife and gave her to his companion. And so the Philistines came up and burned her and her family with fire. And Samson said to them, Since you act like this, I will surely take revenge on you. But after that, I will quit. 
And so he struck them ruthlessly <laughs> with a great slaughter, and he went down and lived in the cleft of the rock of uh, Etam. Verse 9, Then the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and spread out in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? And they said, We have come up to bind Samson in order to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, all 3,000 of them, Did you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. Verse 12, And then they said to Samson, We have come down to bind you so that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me. So they said to him, No, but we will bind you your feet and give you into their hands, yet surely we will not kill you. And then they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock, this cave that he was staying in. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they met him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that the ropes that were on his arms were as flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds dropped uh, from his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, so he reached out and took it and killed a thousand thousand men with it. And then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have killed a thousand men. And when he had finished speaking, he threw the jawbone from his hand, and he named that place Ramath Jehai. Then he came, became very thirsty. And he called to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? But God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, so that water came out of it. And when he drank, his strength returned, and he revived. And therefore he named it in Hakor, which is in Lehi to this day. And so he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. And so another interesting story <laughs> in regard to Samson's life. There seemed to be never a dull moment uh, with this guy, whether it be good or bad. And what we saw in the first few verses is that in Samson's attempt to win back his former fiancé, but in his mind they were married, uh, even though the marriage ceremony never took place, he, he in turn, uh, we discover he felt violated and betrayed basically by everyone. And so because his fiancé, if you remember back in chapter 14, uh, because she told all his would-be groomsmen the secret of Samson's riddle, and she did this because they threatened to burn her alive if she didn't, her father thought, as we read, that Samson hated her intensely, and so the father actually gave her in marriage to Samson's best man instead, because he thought, well, Samson will never want anything to do with her again. I mean, this thing is just a mess <laughs> from the get-go, and it literally goes from insult to injury, as we just read. But you know what? This is one of the things that I love most about God's Word. And it is this. God's Word is not afraid to reveal the weaknesses and the dysfunctions of the various Bible characters. As a matter of fact, there's really too many to number this morning. 
And the reason why God is not uh, afraid to reveal the weaknesses and the dysfunctions of his servants is because, first of all, God is honest. Second, God doesn't have anything to hide. We might, but he doesn't. And then finally, here it is, he wants us to understand that he is willing to use weak and foolish things just like you and just like me. You see, loved ones, if sin and weakness disqualified us from ministry, no one would be serving in God's kingdom, and that's a fact. And so what we discover here is a wonder, wonderful truth, and it's God uses the foolish and the weak things of the world to actually confound the wise. Aren't you glad? Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 1.27, it says this. Let's read this out loud together, shall we? <clears throat> Let's begin. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Should be a very comforting verse to all of us who stumble and bumble through our journey of faith. <laughs> and so, this is one of the marvelous things that we discover about Samson, in that God uses people like Samson, and He uses people like me and like you, despite <laughs> our shortcomings. Now, we read that Samson uh, caught 300 foxes. Now, just picture this. Now, first of all, he had to think this up in his mind, okay? He, he caught 300 foxes. And foxes, you know, unless they have their babies, they, they, don't, they, they don't run around in packs. They, they're isolated creatures, right? And, and so, somehow, he finds... 300 foxes, and then he puts two of them together, and he grabs their tails, and he ties their, uh, a torch in between their tails, and he sets the torch on fire, and they're just running around like banshees, you know, and... He burns down the vineyards and the groves and all of the grain. And, and, and he does this 150 times. I think that God is trying to teach us something here. I think he's trying to reveal something, and, it, and it's this. The story it goes to show that some people will go to immense and intense measures to exact revenge on others. Think of how time-consuming this might, must have been. I mean, this, this isn't a, a day-long event. This took time. This took energy. This took strategy on Samson's part. He had thought this through. And he was uh, determined that he was going to exact his revenge in this way. And so... We read that Samson indeed got his revenge. And, and I want to take time today to talk about the destructive nature of revenge and retaliation. And so with that, what I'd like you to do is turn with me first in your New Testament to the Gospel of Matthew. And we see that Jesus had something to say about this in chapter 5. Verse 38, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 38. Jesus says this, he says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. 
But I say to you, verse 39, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take you your uh, shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to give to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. And he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now let's go to uh, Romans chapter 12, shall we? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans chapter 12. Verses 17 through 19. The Apostle Paul gives us some instruction about this as well. Chapter 12, starting in verse 17, the Apostle writes, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible, so far as it depends on you. Be at peace with all men. Here it is, verse 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so, here... Paul is writing to people who go to church, right? And he's writing these things because uh, for some of us, uh, th this can be an area of stumbling. This can be an area of struggling. And, and he wanted to give us, both Jesus and Paul, a proper perspective when it comes to the topic of revenge. Now, a couple of stories to, to share with you when it comes to revenge. There was a time that Lynn and I were uh, pastoring down in Southern California. Uh, I was an associate pastor at a church there, a great church, and uh, as you oftentimes do, you'll get together with certain families so over for dinner or, you know, lunch or breakfast or whatever it might be, and uh, we were doing that with the uh, people in the congregation and, and we met with this one really nice couple great couple, like them loved Jesus uh, and uh, it was just a really pleasant evening getting to know the, these people and so later on uh, Linda and I were sent out by this church to plant a sister church and so we were no longer a part of that congregation and some years had passed and we had heard that this couple that were, were so in love and so friendly and nice and so forth that they, they had this very volatile divorce that, that took place and uh, we discovered found out that sometime after this or during the divorce proceedings that, that the husband actually uh, went to his wife or ex-wife's home and her car was out there and he planted a pipe bomb underneath her car. Now, thankfully, somehow, some way, it was discovered, and uh, he uh, spent some time uh, in prison, and, and rightly so. But it, 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 again, tells you, like Samson, the extent that some people will go to to exact revenge on someone who they think has unjustly hurt them or harmed them. <laughs> Let me share <clears throat> an even more personal story, a true story. One night, Linda and I decided to go to a movie. I forget what it was. Again, we were down in Southern California. I was pastoring uh, there and we're watching a movie and she doesn't do this anymore uh, 
because of this event, but for some reason, my lovely wife, when we would go to a movie theater, you know, she has long hair, and uh, usually around her hips and so forth, and so what she does when she watches a movie, she took her hair and she flipped it back over the seat, and it was hanging down in another aisle. And so, shortly after she did this, a gentleman came in and sat right behind us. He, he was actually literally right behind her. I, I was here, she was here, and he was back there. And uh, he, he was a, a very large gentleman. And by large, I, I would estimate that he was at least 300 pounds. He was a very large individual. And so we watched the, the, the movie, and uh, after the movie, Linda went to the, the restroom, and while she uh, was in the restroom, she decided to comb out her hair. And as she combed out her hair, she noticed that something was wrong. And what was wrong is that something was missing. <laughs> and what was missing was about four inches of the middle part of her hair. So you can picture the hair goes down like this, and then there is like a field goal post. All this, all this is empty, right? And so she comes out. She's just, you know... Overwhelmed, she can't believe what happened, and she told me what took place. That was the night I lost my salvation. <laughs> and so she tells me this, and immediately I know who did it because there was this only one person that was sitting right behind her. And so I automatically I go on a mission. And the mission was very simple, seek and destroy. <laughs> And so this was a large theater complex, and so I'm going all around, running, looking for this guy. He would not be hard to miss. And so uh, he's nowhere to be found inside, and so I go outside, hoping that I'll see him uh, in, in the parking lot and introduce him to Jesus. <laughs> Just not in the same way I introduce you guys to Jesus on Sunday mornings. And so, thankfully, for my sake, I, I could not find the guy. He was nowhere in, in sight. And, and thankfully, because he was larger than me, about at least twice the size of me, and so just in and of you know, that, he, he probably would have trounced me. And, and uh, besides that, he also had a pair of scissors on him. <laughs> So what am I thinking? I'm thinking revenge. I'm thinking seek and destroy. I'm thinking this guy needs to know Jesus. But thankfully God protected me from my idiocy. For, from my desire to seek revenge. Now here's the kicker. Do you guys want to be creeped out a little bit? We go back. You're going to hear it whether you want to or not. We go back to where we were sitting, the row that we were sitting in, in the theater, and I go to the one right behind where this guy was sitting, and the hair was nowhere to be found. The dude took it with him. And so, need, needless to say, another mission came, you know, no. So, <laughs> But guys, I, I share this with you to say this. The, the desire for revenge is a very real thing in many people's lives. And I have to admit that over the years, I have had to fight off the desire for revenge or retaliation because of wrongs or perceived wrongs that have been done to me. I have to admit that there have been times that I've, I have found myself actually wishing the very 
worst on someone's life rather than praying for the very best for their lives as Jesus and Paul tells us to. But guys, here's the deal. This is what we need to know. Please hear this. Revenge is never truly satisfied until it is brought to the foot of the cross. Let me say that again. Revenge is never truly satisfied until it is brought to the foot of the cross. And you see, the reason why is because it is only there that it can be redeemed and made whole. Yet it is a sad fact that many wars occur because of the desire for revenge. Many lives are ended or damaged because of the desire for revenge. Much pain is experienced and lives are destroyed because of the desire for revenge. And so what I want us to do is I, I, I want to share with you six things that we need to know about revenge as sons and daughters of God. The first is this. Revenge is evil. Revenge is sin. And we must see revenge in that light because to see it any other way is to lessen and minimize its cruel and destructive nature. It must be seen for what it is. You see, revenge feeds and brings out the very worst that is within us. It, it triggers something that is both unhealthy and ungodly within us. Perhaps uh, you have heard the, the saying, revenge is a dish that is best served cold. Right? Well, that saying is accurate because the saying is actually a true reflection of where a person's heart has to go to get to the place that they feel revenge is the only or even worse, the best option. <clears throat> Number two, revenge is the ultimate expression of entitlement. And let me share with you what I mean by that. You see, when we exact revenge on someone, we are demonstrating that we believe that we are entitled to judge others through the eyes of our own self-righteousness rather than through the eyes of God. And so, you see, until we die to entitlement, revenge will always remain one of the options on the table of response. Revenge, in its sick way, truly believes that we have a right to get even. But actually, no such right exists within the kingdom of God. As a matter, matter of fact, that kind of thinking, that, that kind of behavior, it actually comes from a lesser kingdom. <laughs> the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil that always tells you, put yourself first. Number three, <laughs> revenge, it compromises your soul, it consumes your mind, and it corrupts your heart. Again, it compromises your soul. It consumes your mind. It corrupts your heart. You see, revenge, it defiles us from the inside out because it can be an all-consuming force in our lives. And we see this with Samson, not just in, in chapter 15, but in his life. We, we, we see it with Samson is that it was all that he could think of. It, it literally consumed him. And in the same way, it literally takes up residence in our hearts, in our minds. It, guys, it actually pollutes our soul. And there's nothing good that comes from it. 
Now, I want to share with you an illustration, a picture of what re revenge does. You see here on the screen a picture of two lungs. One lung is a non-smoking lung. You could see that it is pink and healthy. The other one is a smoker's lung, and it is blackened and unhealthy. And as we go to the next slide, what we discover is that revenge does to our souls what smoke does to our lungs. It creates darkness within us that will eventually lead to death. Someone once said that a person who seeks revenge should dig two holes. And the reason why is because something has to die inside of us when we see revenge as our only option, as the best option. Two holes are always dug. The next thing that we need to understand about revenge <coughs> is that revenge is an unwillingness to forgive, right? <laughs> Bottom line, revenge is an unwillingness to forgive. As I mentioned earlier, revenge can only be satisfied at the foot of the cross. Revenge does not make us feel better, it only makes us feel bitter. Now, Jesus shared a parable uh, about this in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. <laughs> So would you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 18, if you would like, and we're going to read this <coughs> parable that Jesus shared. And we'll be looking at verses 21 through 35. <coughs> then Peter came... And said to Jesus, verse 21, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. He's thinking in his mind, man, you know, that's being pretty gracious on my part to forgive him seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, <coughs> one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. This is tremendous, millions of dollars. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had in repayment to be made. And so the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. You might want to circle those three words. Compassion, released, forgave. But that slave, the one who received compassion, who was released and who was forgiven, that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, about a day's worth of work. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. 
And so when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Wow. A very powerful parable. But the fact of the matter is that this is exactly what we do when we desire or when we seek revenge. God has forgiven us of so much wrong that we have done, of so many unpaid debts that we have towards Him, but we in turn ignore that and then refuse to forgive those who have wronged us in much much, much lesser ways. It was C.S. Lewis who said this profound statement. He said, To be a Christian is to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Wow. Ouch. Loved one, has someone done to you the inexcusable? We have to realize that we have all done the inexcusable towards God. And that's why Jesus came and died upon the cross and paid for our sins. Because it was a debt too great for us to pay. He paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. To be a Christian, my friends, is to forgive the inexcusable. You see, revenge is the antithesis of the gospel which teaches us about love and forgiveness. And so when we fail to forgive, we fail to love, and we fail to live out the gospel message. Simply put, we fail to be like Jesus. And this, of course, was part of <laughs> Samson's problem, right? You see, Samson knew and experienced the power of God in his life many times. But he knew very little about the love of God. We see the power... But there is an absence of love. And power operating apart from love can easily become corrupted, and such was the case with Samson. Next, revenge is an act of mistaken justice. Again, revenge is an act of mistaken justice. <laughs> you see, revenge is meant for payback, right? Justice is meant to make things right. So revenge should never ever be confused with justice. It is actually the exact opposite. And so revenge is very much so an act of mistaken justice because its only goal is to inflict pain and punishment and it is not concerned with what is just whatsoever. And so here's the deal. If someone wrongs us and we want to hurt them, we seek revenge. But if someone wrongs us and we want to help them, we seek to love and forgive. And guys, Scripture makes it very clear. Scripture tells us that the anger of man never, ever, ever accomplishes the righteousness of God. It never does. And then finally, revenge is a lack of trust in God to make things right. 
It's a lack in trust of God to make things right. You see, when we seek vengeance, we're actually placing ourselves above God, and we make ourselves the ultimate authority over our life and the life of others. You see, revenge is thinking that we know what punishment a person deserves. And it is actually, get this, revenge is actually an act of fear that God will not do what we think he should do. It's an act of fear that God might actually have the audacity to do what we should actually do, and that is extend grace and forgive them. You see, <laughs> God's first step is to forgive us. Let me say that again. God's first step is always to forgive us. Now, oftentimes, He also chooses to correct us. And if correction doesn't work, He will then discipline us. But punishing us is usually not part of his scheme of things. But we have the tendency when we're hurt, when we're wrong, we want to go right to punishing someone, don't we? And the reason why is very simple. Because to punish is to seek what we incorrectly think what is best for us. But to love and forgive is always what is best for the other person, listen, as well as ourselves. Simply put, revenge has only ourselves in mind, whereas forgiveness and love has the other person in mind as well as ourselves in mind. But even more than this, it has God in mind. And loved ones... Whenever we remove God from the equation, the math never, ever, ever adds up. It never equates. It never adds up. It always misses the mark. <clears throat> I want to close by sharing with you uh, another story. I want to picture your, you to picture yourself in heaven. Jesus has come. He has taken us all away. <clears throat> and we're all in heaven. And we're about to enjoy the great wedding feast of the Lamb. And you are led to your seat at your table, but you're blindfolded. You come there... You sit down, your angelic host takes off your blindfold, and before you is just the, um, the most amazing meal that you have ever laid eyes on. Just the color of the food blows you away. Just the smell is, <laughs> is uh, filling and intoxicating in and of itself. And you're just all caught up in what you're about to chow down. I mean, you can't, you can't believe the colors, the smell, the, oh. And then, all of a sudden, you, you realize that there are other people around you. And you look up, and you are surrounded, listen, by every Christian you have hurt. And every Christian who has ever hurt you. Right in front of you is the friend who stabbed you in the back. Right next to him is the other friend who twisted the knife. Right next to you is the spouse that cheated on you. Across the way is a Christian who falsely accused you. Next to him is the pastor who harshly disciplined you. Then there's the business partner who embezzled money from your business and you went bankrupt and you lost everything. And then 
at this table. It's a very big table. The church member who brought division to your church and many people were hurt as a result of it. The ministry associate who lied and attacked your character because they were jealous and self-seeking. The boss who fired you unjustly. The family member who abused you. The judge who awarded custody of your children to your spouse. And the list goes on and on and on and on and they're all there. Every one of them, as well as every one that you too have hurt in your life. And guys, all of you, every single one of you have two things in common. First, you have all been forgiven of your sins. And second, you are as surprised to see them just as much as they are surprised to see you. <laughs> and then Jesus comes, and he sits in your midst, and he looks at each one of you in the eye, and he says with glistening eyes and with the biggest smile that you could possibly imagine, Behold, I make all things new. Pass the mashed potatoes. <laughs> that simple. You see, when we're able to forgive those who have hurt us, we're able to share our mashed potatoes with them. We're able to break bread and, and fellowship with them with a pure heart, with a loving heart, with a forgiving heart, just as we will do on that great day of the feast. I promise you, you're going to see people that you don't want to see. And I promise you this, you're going to be so glad you did. And you'll be caught up in the wonder of what grace and love and mercy and compassion and release is all about in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. Would you stand with me? And let's uh, close the message <clears throat> with this prayer. I'm going to go over here instead. Let's pray this out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. God of mercy and grace, thank you that you are a God that forgives. We ask that you would grant us the same grace and mercy so that we can forgive those who have sinned against us. Help us learn how to live and let go. To not wish the worst, but to pray the best. Help us to bring our hurts to the foot of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Now I'm going to ask everyone just to, to bow your head for a moment. We don't do this often. But this is such a, a topic that hits home to so many of us. And so often we can live in bondage all throughout our Christian life simply because we have chosen not to forgive. Simply because we, we think that revenge is the best option or we really desire uh, that, that people fail and, and, and their lives are destroyed because of something that they did uh, against us. I just want to want to ask, you know, that word release Jesus used. And I'm just going to ask you r right now, and, and Jerry, if you can just begin playing. I want to ask you to, to release whatever it is. Hey, people 
have done some inexcusable things to me <laughs> over my life. And I'm sure that there have been people who have done inexcusable things to you. But you see, when we live in that on a day-to-day -day basis, we're really becoming that person's slave. We're becoming a prisoner to that person. And we don't want to be the slave to any man. Jesus wants us to walk in that release. And so I just want to ask you today if you need to forgive somebody and you are choosing to let go of any vengeful thoughts, of any hatred towards them, would you just as every eye is closed just for privacy's sake, would you lift up your hand and would you say, today I'm choosing to forgive? Today I'm choosing to let go. Today I'm choosing to release that person from my judgment, from my anger. Many hands have been raised. I just want to give you one, one more opportunity to choose to live the gospel not just talk about it, but to live it. And I want to ask you that even as Jesus forgave the inexcusable in you, that you will forgive the inexcusable in someone else. Anyone else? Lord, I thank you for these courageous people. Father, it's a courageous thing to release. It's a courageous thing to let go. Lord, we don't want to live petty lives. We don't want to live lives where other people influence who we are, the character of our hearts. And I just pray release. I pray release on each one that raised their hand. And Lord, I'm in that group. I, I raise my hand too. I pray release for me. I pray release for each and every one. Set us free, Lord. And let us walk in the way of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen ask the prayer team, the elders to come forward. If you need any further prayer for what we just talked about or for anything else, I want to encourage you to come forward. And we'd love to just stand with you and pray a prayer over you believing God's best for your life. This is a new year. Let's let this old stuff be where it belongs. On our backside, right? Let's move forward, looking at Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. God bless.